All right. Well, I'm back again with Manuel Post. And what we're going to discuss today is um, basically the concept of cultural cognitive grammar and sense making. And this is an exploratory conversation. Uh, so another dialogos, hopefully. We'll see what spirit emerges uh, in the course. And we want to sort of discuss what sense making is, why it's important, how that relates to cultural cognitive grammar, which is a little bit uh, more difficult to, to sort of get your head around in some sense that John Bravigi talks about it quite a bit. Um, but for me, sense making is all about finding the intelligibility in the things around us. And we're plagued by things like chaos and we, we're pattern finding machines, right? We're, we, we see patterns everywhere, even where they're not. And so you want good sense making. Good sense making means knowing, we'll say real patterns or good patterns from not real patterns or, or bad patterns, patterns that'll send you, maybe they're temporary, they'll send you in the wrong direction, right? Away from virtues and values, that would be bad, right? So you want that, that sense. And the, the way that, for me, that cultural cognitive grammar comes into it is the culture uses grammar, language, um, to make sense of, to cognize, to think about the world. And that's part, that's sort of a bigger bucket, right? It's part of sense making. Um, because if something doesn't make sense, and it's part of your cultural cognitive grammar, or your cultural cognitive grammars become corrupt, which is maybe maybe more likely, uh, then it's not helping you anymore. But it's still part of sense making because it would just be a negative affect, right? So if you're if you're using a term, uh, uh, you know, and it it's in contradiction to how you're implementing what you're implementing, for example, then. That's that 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 should your sense making should tell you no no there's a conflict between the words you're using and the things you're doing there's a conflict between the words you're using and 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 other words you're using because these these conflicts are important because that breaks intelligibility so so what do you think Manuel how do you how do you like this uh, this topic of sense making in cognitive cultural grammar <laughs> right so so sense making is is something you have to do right like it's necessary um, and. And since we're we're creatures who use language, right? We use propositions to to assist us in our sense making and to get the higher level uh, understanding going and and structure going. And 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 that is that is contained within within the cultural cognitive grammar, right? So the cultural cognitive grammar is like like a structure that that holds our sense making and it, it affords a, a certain set of things. And then that it, it is it is important to realize that that you have a cognitive grammar right like you, you have a way by which you filter and privilege information and how you structure that and how you relate that to other information right so that that is that is a thing that you have and then when we're starting to talk about cultural cognitive grammar that means that the culture over time described or developed a way to how to relate to reality. And then there's also a local element of the culture, which is more related to the implementation, right? Or, or, or pop, popular culture, or more correctly. And a popular culture is, is using, well, like the language, right? Like that we inherited from our ancestors to to relate to a certain aspect of reality, because usually they don't they don't have a holistic worldview, and um, and I think when we're talking about the cultural cognitive grammar and it being broken, we can we can talk on two levels. One is like okay, like what we inherited from our ancestors is bad, and like I don't think we want to go there because that's what the postmoderns try to do, and I don't think that ends well, or at least we don't have the tools to to solve that properly. And then, and then we have we have this uh, this popular culture uh, grammar, right? Which is like, okay, um, I'm a being in the world. Like I have certain needs. Uh, like like how do we fulfill those needs? And and when the structure that we're using to fulfill those needs is is insufficient or whatever, we we might get locked into certain perspectives. And I think that's that's the problem that people are running into 
all the time. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, that, that sort of goes back to relevance realization, right? If you're focused on the wrong things, you create a cultural cognitive grammar that focuses on those things and you'll put everything in that frame and that's just a bad frame all of a sudden. And then you can't, you know, you oh, your politics rules the world and, and therefore when my candidate gets in office, then, uh, or my party, then then everything will get fixed. And then it doesn't. And that leads to resentment and frustration. And But you have bad framing on the world, like politics doesn't fix the world. So obviously, right, it should be obvious, but people still keep that frame. And that is the result of postmodern, oh, frames are arbitrary. No, they're not. They're not, our words are not arbitrary. None of this is arbitrary. Uh, it's very much connected. And when it becomes disconnected, then there's a problem. And you say, well, everybody else is doing it too, but that's not helpful. <laughs> But and, and there's a way in which I think that this links back to ways of knowing, right? So <clears throat> if we go with a two, two model way of, of knowing things, there's a, there's a way that you know things, say propositionally, right? Or, or from the propositions and procedures. There's also a way you know things from your participation in the world, right? And I've sort of talked about this before, where you've got the farmer and then you've got the person studying farming. The person studying farming does not know how to run a farm and usually doesn't give good advice to the farmer who knows how to run a farm. Why? Because they're not doing the work, they're not participating, all their knowledge is propositional from books and from you know, a, a framed narrative understanding of farming, which has nothing to do with actual farming. And it was a beautiful example that got brought up on Clubhouse uh, uh, within the past week or so, where this person pointed out that actually, there's a scientifically valid reason for the pagan, roughly speaking, because it's a very old practice, practice of planting at night on the night of the full moon. And it, it has to do with when you turn the soil, the things that are there will automatically germinate uh, the minute sunlight or any light hits them. And so the less light there is, the less likely you are to get weeds if you plant your seeds when there's absolutely no light, even, even reflected light. And it's like, Oh, so that's just a more efficient method of farming that science knew nothing about because it just discounted it as mythological and foolish and crazy because it couldn't see the connection, right? And so there's a way in which we get stuck in this, in this framing of, well, we, we have to know things in order to do things. It's like, no, you can do things without knowing them, uh, you know, in the, in the propositional sense, because there is a type of knowledge that is knowledge of how to do something, how to participate with something. And so... That sort of highlights uh, maybe a mode of sense making where the propositional or explanatory sense, the articulation sense that you have of something matches the sense in which it's actually done in the world. And when that's not true, there's a sense of bullshit, to use the technical term that Verbeke likes so much, right? That, so when somebody's spewing at you, oh, look, the, the way to farm is, you know, you, you have to you have to take into account temperature and you have to take into account the type of seeds and you have to take it right on and on and on. And then the farmer knows, no, no, the, all of that is less relevant than doing it on the full moon between this time and this time, <laughs> right? And or the new moon rather, uh, between these two times. I, all of those other things might be relevant, but they might be less relevant because again, it might be that the weeds are more important and not having weeds and, and having good seed germination is, is, the, is the key. And so that's the sense in which, you know, there's a mismatch and, and having that match up, you know, with, with, we'll say that the older explanations, even though they're not scientific explanations, they're mythological explanations, uh, but they may make more sense because they match the participation in the world. And so that's a better way of maybe understanding sense-making is, when things match in their explanation, in their propositions, in their procedures, and in their implementation, we'll say in the, in the participatory implementation and the poetic implementation, right? The way things sort of weave together, because that's what poetry is, it's weaving together a bunch of things. Um, then you get a better, deeper sense of, of what, what actually is intelligible. All right. So, so what I what I heard you say is, there's a there's a connection that needs to be had from from the proposition to to the participation, and and 
that 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 is required for proper sense making. But I I want to flip that a little bit and say, well, like you can only go so far with, with your propositions until you need a a certain participatory understanding to to bolster your propositions and and like there might be this this grammar available in your language uh to to facilitate the deeper understanding but if you don't have the participatory understanding you cannot relate to that deeper understanding and i i think i think that is that is actually the the, the main problem because because when, when we're saying we're talking about fixing the cultural cognitive grammar right like i i do think that that grammar is is available to us right like because we're not going to reinvent anything like like people already thought of these things way before us so 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 if we're talking about a matter of 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 things being accessible and 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 how to make them accessible and and how to make them salient to people right because like if 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 you want to have a scientific understanding of farming like yeah like why would you ever look at the full moon right like 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 what would motivate right. you to participate in trying to understand that in the first place because from the scientific perspective that is that is not an a natural uh frame to to inhabit yeah, exactly. And and yeah, I like I like what you said. I mean, you know, bad news, we're not going to we as as even a culture are not going to invent invent some new word or concept that hasn't been invented before. Very bad news. Good news, we don't have to. This is good news. It gets all there. We don't have to be wicked smart. We don't have to come up with, you know, big brand answers. Those answers are available to us. We have to be willing to engage with them because we have to be willing to engage with things we didn't create that we're not smart enough necessarily to create, but we also don't have to. We can focus on more important things. And I think, yeah, that's <clears throat> that's that's part of this idea that you know our egos get in our in our way of understanding things because we want this enhanced understanding. And then you can see a way in which when you're searching for sense making and you hear well articulated argument right where everything makes sense and falls into place and they're you know, they're using these fancy words and you know maybe some of the words are new or or maybe they're old words and they're, they're trying to uh, cast them in a certain light right that that sounds very satisfying and it certainly makes sense and right there's some some sense that it makes but if it doesn't connect back to participation it doesn't make as much sense as it could and so it may be better than nothing but it may not be right and that's where sense making comes in and, and cultural cognitive grammar is not just about the words that you're using, but the way that you're using them. Right. And so a lot of the videos on my channel, I, I sort of explore three aspects of, of terminology. Right. The aspect that you intended in in your head to how you're using it. The aspect that you anticipate other people are going to be interpreting it and in the aspect in which it's interpreted. Right. And so. That's a big problem because, and, and it's not an avoidable problem because you're not other people. So when you use a word, any word, their interpretation might be slightly different than yours or include things that yours doesn't or not include the things that you think are most important. All of that is a problem. But as we drift further apart, as things get more differentiated, as there's more diversity in the world, and diversity basically equals chaos, uh, what, what happens is, we don't have a coherent grammar anymore. We don't have that cultural cognitive grammar in common anymore. And so that breaks the sense-making capability apart, not just sense-making, but the ability for us to communicate using language actually starts to fracture and you get that Tower of Babel thing, which might be why that story is there, right? To some extent, it's not the only part of that story, but that's one part of the story. That's one aspect of it. And you, you can very much see that uh, uh, in there. That, that breaking apart. So yeah, I, I mean, it, there's definitely a, a next level of sense making where one is just some guy standing on a stage doing a TED talk, you know, giving you a story that that sounds good, it's very articulate, lots of cool words, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be wrong to not make sense. Like lots of right things don't make sense. It, 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 there, there's one sense in which 
the mind control space dragon of capitalism that's forcing everybody to uh, act strangely uh, is correct, but it doesn't make sense to talk about it that way, uh, even though that's the way a lot of people seem to talk about it. Um, they don't use that terminology, that, that's mine, but um, because you can't, you can't do anything about it. Like if that were true, it wouldn't be helpful. Like if lizard people run the White House, you're not fixing the lizard people problem. <laughs> Yeah, so when when we're talking about about having conversations and 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 yeah, like so you you can you can see that when people enter a a conversation with a frame, which better would be a value, right? Like like I I I find this important, and in order to support that, I erect a structure, right? Like a structure of sense making that will convey that I'm right. So what what I'm what ends up happening when you're doing that, right? Like you're not you're not cohering to to the value of the conversation as such as primary over your personal interest and the interest that you're promoting. Like so and 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 this is where we get into the Tower of Babel uh, problem, right? Because now, when I'm having a conversation with with a person that 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 has that aspect, I I have to, well, I don't have to, but if 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 I want to relate to them, I have to relate to their grammar, right? Like I have I have to have a relationship to their grammar, and like I I have to either prove to them that there's a better grammar, which is a really hard project because that would also uh, mean contesting their value. Um, or I have to play within their grammar to to show them the contradictions and, and why their frame, which is built upon their value, right, is is insufficient to have right relationship with, with their problem. Um, and so, so if if we're talking about fixing the cultural cognitive grammar, right? Like you, you, you can you can look at yourself in in those two frames, right? Like either I I am able to step into their frame and participate on their rules to a certain extent, or I am able to lead them out of their frame in in into the bigger frame in which we can actually resolve the issue, um, and. And yeah, right, like that, that would keep, be giving them more grammar, right? And then the question is, well, like, do they have the participation? And, and I, I included personal uh, value as well as, as, as the external value. And, and this is where people often get stuck, right? Like, cause, cause they, they start identifying with, with the cause or, or, and, and then you, you, you trigger them emotionally, right? So, so they're emotionally invested in the frame that they're in, and then you're not going to get them out of that frame. Yeah, and there's certainly, <clears throat> people need to be open to new ideas. And people think they're open to new ideas when they're discussing something, but most of the time they're discussing something, they're trying to convince you of something. <laughs> and they, you know, they do that innocently, right? They're not, they're not deliberately, nefariously trying to trap you into their, you know, evil world or something, right? Usually what they're actually doing is they are trying to justify thoughts that they've already in their head had conclusions about and are vet invested in. And so they're, they're trying to bring you into their investment more than anything else. And no, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that, um, except that if they're wrong, it's hard to show them that they're wrong. It's hard to break them out, right? And so I, I talked about this. I, I mean, we talked about it in the in the uh, enchantment video. And I talked about it again in the other enchantment video, the shorter version, um, the explanation version that I just released. And you know, that's basically, you know, you have to be willing to hear something that you don't want to hear and deal with counter examples. Because if you can't explain counter examples, you know, or or you're your system doesn't account for counterexamples. And you can't just say, oh, well, that's just an exception. That, that, that doesn't necessarily work. It might work, it might be true, uh, but 
it, it's it, it's a good indication if there's lots of exceptions or lots of systems like that where you you have to say that's an exception or that doesn't count or whatever then then maybe you are wrong like maybe your frame is broken and it's well, very it's hard to get people out of frames right like when when there's a lot of exceptions it's insufficient right you're missing a right. point somewhere right right and the component you're probably missing is a framing component and not just a simple you know a simple matter of a misunderstanding or misuse of a couple of words or a bad sentence right it's probably that the, the frame that you are using the lens that you're using to look at this thing is just wrong and it doesn't work and that happens that's okay but you have to be open enough to to, to kind of change it and i think that's why when I when I go over the concepts in my videos on this channel, right, I, I tend to do this thing where I have the, the three parts, like the way you're thinking about it, the way you intend, what you intend to convey, right, in interpretation, and the way it's being heard. Because I think all three are there all the time. And you want them to match as closely as possible. And when they don't match, that's when you, you know, that's again when you run into this problem. And then everybody's trying to frame everything. And you know, if you if you frame. And, and you know, framing devices are all over the place, right? Like, well, how long ago did you stop beating your wife, right? That's a framing device that that puts a bad light on somebody. <laughs> like, I brought up reasons. Oh, I hate that. I hate that that mechanism. Yeah, but people use it all the time, and they use it in sneakier ways that, than that, where you you don't really notice that that they framed something in a negative light or in a positive light when when that's inappropriate right when, when you're supposed to be reporting facts for example you don't frame things as negative or positive that, that's you know that that's no good i mean unless you intend to and i often intend to right i use a lot of hyperbole to to highlight a that fact and b what i'm trying to highlight because i want people to look there but right? i don't i don't just want people to come to some conclusion from some neutral space because i don't think that's reasonable right i want them to look there so getting people to consider have you considered that you're the baddie have you considered you're on the side of evil? Have you considered that there's a darkness in your heart that you may manifest in the world, right? Because we, we all have those problems. Oh, we all no. have those problems. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and then that's where the framing becomes important. And then framings give us sense making and understanding of a bunch of things, usually, or one important issue. And so we don't want to break that apart because you're basically breaking your sense making when you break your frame. You're basically breaking your sense making about probably a bunch of things or about one really important thing. And that can be very traumatic. But that, that I think is the way in which sense making, if you can't, and again, like you can tell an infinite number of articulate stories about something. Like I could give you five or six stories about the housing crash in, in 2008, 2009, right? All of them are wrong, by the way, but they'd sound very good and quite articulate. And you'd be like, ooh, happy. And people have done this. Like, there's lots of stories out there about what caused it. And you, you can invoke tranches and second order derivatives. And that was the real problem was the over leveraging. It's all nonsense. That's, that's not what happened. Objectively, or at least as close to interest objective as you can get, you can, look at the, you can look at what happened. You can see lawsuits and cases and go, oh, you know, none of this had anything to do with any of that, right? They just, nobody knew what anybody owned and everybody lied about it. And now, and now we have massive fraud, it's very basic, simple fraud, but, you know, ma making sense of that in the context of evil economists were deceiving the public. They didn't even know what was going on. <laughs> they had their models and their models are evil for sure, but they weren't detailed enough to account for basic fraud, which is what was really happening. And, and maybe the basic fraud was made more profitable by the bad economic models. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and, and derivatives do that, right? Anytime you use a derivative, you're actually leveraging. You're leveraging things in the future. And, and yeah, if you're on the wrong side of that lever, then everybody loses money, which has definitely happened in the housing crisis, but not for the reason of the lever, for the reason of the fraud. Once the fraud becomes exposed, you realize, oh, the lever really looks like this. And then everybody, all the money vanishes because effectively it was never there. It was always an illusion. And if you can keep up the illusion long enough, or you don't, you don't have too many exposures or, or too many foreclosures uh, that are problematic, then nobody notices. Uh, and it's not a problem. Uh, it can dissipate over time. But eventually these things always catch up with you, especially when there's no incentive not to do the fraud. So you can see the sense-making lens really matters because if you're wicked smart, then you know you want some complicated, you know, the I we thing, right? You want some complicated answer, uh, you know, to be to to satisfy your own ego. 
and the people you're listening to because they they get very you know once you give somebody a really complicated answer to something really complicated they get very excited like oh aha that must be true because it's complicated it's like yeah a lot of things are really simple well yeah right like what what is simple right like or what is a thing well it it is dependent on our relationship with it right our relationships with things are are fairly simple like i i don't know about maybe we should have a, someone in the comments uh, respond with the complicated relationships that they have with things but that that that's probably going to be the end of a, a story that they're telling themselves <laughs> trying to to justify things to themselves instead of just realizing the, the simplicity that that their action uh, has in it, and and I think that's that's uh, what what you're pointing at, right? Like, okay, like we can describe things in in a complicated way, or we we can describe things in in a way that that we use to to navigate our action, and and that that navigating action level is is the place that we live right like that's the relationship we have with the world and that's that's what we should privilege over the other ones whether they're right or wrong uh, at that point is isn't even relevant um um and then well like okay so we're, we're, we're having this 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 idea right like okay like i have this concept of, of something in my mind, I have my articulation of the concept, and then I have the person receiving my articulation. Well, like that's that's a cognitive grammar, right? Like like when I start framing the world in that way, I can have conversations in a specific type of way that allows me to do certain things. And when I think that the the, the thing that I have in my head is the same thing as I say, then my relationship with the world will be a lot different, right? And one of the things that will uh, also happen then is that I will be emotionally invested with, with how people react to the things I say, because I have an equal signs in my mind between my words and myself. And therefore, if my words get rejected, I get rejected instead of that I am propagating an idea and the idea gets rejected, right? So, and if we're in that space, then the social dynamics and, 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 and the social game that, that we're playing totally changes, right? Like we, we need to have different affordances for people, right? And you can already kind of see the, the world that I'm drawing up and that you're going to probably know some people who live in that world. Um, so, so yeah, that that is why the cultural cognitive uh, grammar is important, and um, and why fixing that problem isn't necessarily changing words or whatever, right? Like it it is it has to do with the other person and their capacity to make that discernment in general, but also make that discernment in the moment because those two things are also not the same. Um, so, so yeah, like, like now, now we're in the realm of, of transformation and, and we're getting into, well, like, okay, like what does that require of us to, to, to be able to make those discernments? Yeah, exactly. I think, I think there's a way in which <clears throat> when you, you know, when, when we're interacting, it should you know it should be incumbent upon us not to impose our views right impose our grammar but to make it understandable to the other person right because if we don't do that then they can get confused right so if i'm using the word race in a way that doesn't make any sense to you because i'm referring to people of all races but kicking them out as important and special that those two things don't work because you know, race would be specific to a uh, you know, one one particular type of race, right? Once you once you mix it up and start, well, you know, this person of this race is not the same as the other persons of this race. Now the word race is not useful anymore, right? In that context, 
And so it would be beholden upon me to explain when I'm using race, what you know, what I actually mean, right? And then what the discernment is. And if the discernment doesn't make any sense to the other person, then there may be a reason for that. Like maybe it doesn't make any sense. Maybe the person's trying to magic you, to enchant you, right? <clears throat> or maybe the person is unaware themselves that they've been enchanted and told a narrative that that doesn't work, it doesn't fit, you can't participate with. Right. And so you want to engage in such a way. And I try to do this on, on this channel, right? On, on you know, in the navigation. I'm trying to show people, exemplify this whole idea of word usage and why and how it's important, right? To fix that relationship. Like if you have a view of capitalism that isn't useful because you can't participate with it correctly or because if, that, if this definition is true, no possible solution exists because lots of definitions of capitalism imply no, no possible solution. There's no solution to these problems, right? It's like postmodernism, right? If power's the thing and power's at the top, you're never changing that ever. So, I mean, don't have that frame because it's not a helpful frame. You can't participate in that frame correctly. Maybe you can explain a bunch of things that way. Maybe that makes you feel better. Fair enough, we need to feel better sometimes. But if you can't participate with it, you know, what good is it? And that, that's why I'm a pragmatist, right? Because if, if the participation can't happen, then we're in trouble. And we want sense making that doesn't just sound good and feel good and make us comfortable. We want sense making that we can participate with, right? We want it. We want that intimate connection, not just with the person we're talking to, but also with the world at large and hopefully with the virtues and values as well, right? We want all of that stuff to be connected because that's enchantment, right? Now, re enchanted is possibility and potential in the world. If the world is just power and the people at the top have it, there's no possibility of potential for you. You're screwed. <laughs> you're, you're totally screwed. Now you can go, oh, well, but, but there's ways to get that power, right? It's like, okay, what are, what, what are they? Who conveys that power? Because in a lot of cases, you can come up with examples where mandate didn't work, right? Somebody said they were going to implement a bill and it never got passed. Like, are you sure power works that way? Are you sure it was properly conveyed? Right. Are you sure it came from somewhere uh, above, we'll say, right? Because it doesn't seem to, right? And then, you know, that's, a, that's see my video on power uh, and, and, and principalities, because those are, those are two important videos. Um, those definitions are important because they help you to make sense of the world in a way that the culture is using the terms rather than in a way of your understanding of the terms or your desired understanding, because a lot of people want to understand things or make sense of things in the mode where they, where whatever failures they have are excused by their explanation. So they're using explanations that allow them to take no action or allow them not to take responsibility for past actions or allow them not to take responsibility for not taking action. Right, or, or they are taking action, right? And then they they will be enslaved to the narrative to achieve power right so so then in, instead of sitting in the narrative where they're sub, sub subjected to the power they're sitting in the narrative where they're subjected to gaining power right like so, so they, it's like okay like so what did you actually gain by trading this this war chief for this other war chief um and yeah, like like those those issues as have been uh, discussed, and and there are solutions actually. Um, but yeah, people don't usually like those solutions because because then they, they they need to give up the narrative and and their sense making, and 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 they need to reconstitute themselves in 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 a new frame. And and yeah, right. Like like if if that frame is is closer in accordance with reality right like that that should be the place that they they want to go right but then in order to to be able to make that decision right like you need to have this highest value which is being in right relationship with with reality uh, that that allows you to to give up something of lesser value to to maintain that highest value and 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 
that yeah like that that value can be instantiated in the conversation like i said earlier right like but it, it can also be in, instantiated in in your life as such or or in a relationship right like 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 that value of of having the thing and, and being in right relationship to it is it is is something that you you need <laughs> in order to do all the other things. And, and, and that realization uh, is, is maybe the first step to, to fixing the cultural cognitive grammar. Right? It's like, okay, yes, right? Like there, there are necessary things, right? Like things are not arbitrary. Uh, one of the necessary things is, is that you're in a thing or in, in a structure. And, and that, that has certain requirements of you and you have to voluntarily participate, uh, which, which means make sacrifices, right? Because like, like you're, you're not gonna participate without giving up something else in the world. Um, and then by, by making that sacrifice, then a new realm of potential opens up, right? And now we can go back to to, to this this uh, participatory element, right? Like, so if, if you don't have that participatory experience of, of okay, like, like that space is there, right? Like there's a set of affordances that, that come into being as a consequence of me partic participating in this way, then like, like, how are you gonna relate to that? Right? Like, how are you gonna understand that if, 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 you, if, you, don't, if you don't have insight in? Right, because because it, you you can't you can't conceive of it. Right, like it it is it is not real until you have the experience of it being real, and 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 then uh, yeah, then then when when you when you get that right, like when when you get the pattern of of that affordance, then you can you can start transforming yourself as as an individual that is participating in that way in the world right and that totally changes uh, your cultural cognitive grammar right like the the, the 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 way that you're relating to people right like the the way that you're you're valuing things um and and yeah right like and that's why it's a big big thing right like it's it's really foundational to to people's self-conception yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think that's that's part of the problem is if you get caught up with that and <clears throat> they are making an excuse, you know, in terms of you know maybe to excuse their behavior with these narratives and they don't necessarily realize that or you know, maybe they they got their excuse from somebody smart sounding on the internet and then they like aha this person gave me a framing in which my failure to get a better job is not mine it's actually due to you know, the powers that be or the lizard people or you know the way the way capitalism works like fundamentally i'm not properly valued in capitalism because capitalism doesn't know me or, or something you know equally crazy um and and a lot of these cultural cognitive grammar traps are set up or, or framing traps are set up um to explain the lack of intimacy right to explain and excuse that missing intimacy that, that that missing connectedness that deep connectedness that that we need to really be be better people right because you there's a way in which being around other people makes you worse because you know you, you both have flaws and it's flaws plus flaws right but there's also a way in which it makes you better and and hopefully you're around people that you know you make them better and they make you better that's a thing Right? It's not all like everything you add is a negative or everything you add is a positive. There's good mixes and bad mixes. And yeah, this gets back to discernment, which nobody wants to do. Um, but that's what's really important about cultural cognitive grammar and figuring out if you're in a bad frame and figuring out if you're enchanted. It's all about discernment around these topics. Like how do you interface with discerning a good grammar from a bad grammar? What, what is the culture doing when the culture is talking about safety? Right. Or what's it doing when it's talking about follow the science or what's it doing? What, what's the culture up to? Like, what's the zeitgeist? Like, what's really going on underneath those things when we're using this terminology? Yeah. And, and it just appears to me that uh, 
when you're making an excuse, right? Like, what are you doing, right? Like, you, you, you're basically saying, right? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to get on the other side of the wall. Um, like, like I, like I'm, I'm not even sure if there is another side of the wall. Um, and now I am, I'm, I'm going to construct a world where either I should have been helped over the wall or the wall shouldn't exist or the wall is impenetrable so you can't ask me to cross the wall or so, so that there, there's there's i don't know like we might we might have a complete list of that but like it's it's not relevant what the list is right like what is important is they they're acting out a pattern right like okay so there's something that's inaccessible to me um and, and maybe inconceivable, and how can I make the world work where that is true? Instead of saying, well, no, there there is an insufficiency in me because there are people on the other side, and I can join these people, and like I, I just need to find the right circumstances where I can find a way to actually get to the other side of the wall. Yeah, that's trade-offs and transformation, yeah. Yeah, and so a lot of these narrative framings are you know, so we don't have to transform, or we don't have to make a trade-off. We can get we can get something for nothing in essence. And it seems in our world like oh, that's happening all the time. We're just we're just getting the good and not getting bad, or we're able to just get the good and not get the bad. But I think that's that's uh, not the way the world is, um, for better or for worse, right? And I think that's where the problem comes in. Is it no? We can't we can't we don't have the option to choose that. And yeah, the fact that somebody else is doing something should give you pause. <laughs> like, why am I not doing that? And, and look, there's been there was a there was a time I was working for a for a pharmaceutical company, research lab. Learned a lot about the pharmaceutical industry working at the research lab. Learned a real lot. And the the owner, the coolest guy ever, was like just one of these cool guys, legend in the industry. Apparently, I, I, I only I only worked for the one one company, and they got bought by another company. But while I was there, but he said, well, you know how to build these, you know, complicated compute structures, right? This is before the cloud, roughly speaking, right? And I had built them, I built them a test one with a couple of rigs. They paid for all the, all the hardware. So I get to you know, deal with very expensive hardware for free and, and get a bunch of stuff working that otherwise wouldn't be working. And, and I, um, and, and I built this and he said, you know what, why don't you do that? What are you doing here? I mean, we're paying you well, but we're not paying you that well. Like you can make lots of money. And I was like, yeah, but I just to fly all over the country. And sure, you know, I could charge, you know, I, I said, I could charge like $500 an hour to do that easily. And that was back when $500 an hour was a lot more money than it is now. And, but I don't want to fly around the country and, and stress myself out. I'd rather, you know, the near Boston at the time, like, I'd rather just drive into Boston and, and, you know, have a nice, easy, easy commute where I'm not going through airports and stressing out over that. Because especially back then, that would really stress me out being at an airport. And, um, you know, missing flights and stuff would, would have driven me crazy. So um, I said, it's not worth the money. I could have made the money. It was easy to do. I've, I've always been able to make a lot more money than I've actually made. That's not hard uh, for me. Uh, maybe it's hard for you. But, you know, I, I knew I was trading off that money for comfort. I, I just was, right? If you want to make a lot of money, you got to give up some comfort, right? You got to give up your time or you've got to give up your weekends. You've got to give your holidays, right? You've got to get You'd be on call, right? There's, there's, there's all these things, there's all these trade-offs you have to make. And if you don't know what trade-offs you're making, because you're always making trade-offs, and I, I have to do a video on that. I haven't done it yet. I'm going to do a trade-offs video. It's going to be hard, right? Well, if you don't know what trade-offs you're making, it's a problem, right? And if you, if you have a narrative that fools you into thinking you're not making a trade-off, you're probably enchanted by a bad narrative, right? It's probably bad framing. And uh, yeah, there's got to be a way we can figure out what bad framing looks like. I mean, I know we've touched on a little bit here, right, in, in, in the context of cultural cognitive grammar and how it, you know, it, it's one way to make yourself feel comfortable. Um, but, you know, when it doesn't work out, it, that's got to switch from comfort to resentment and anger. And a lot of people, you know, as they go on and they, they you know, I know this one thing's going to work, even though it's never going to work, um, they get more and more frustrated and more and more angry and more and more resentful and that's not better because we need less of that. So, so one 
bad framing is is wanting to have your cake and eat it too, right? Which going going back to the wall example, right? Like I, I want to live in my excuse on this side of the wall, but I also want to be on the other side. And it's like, yeah, those those two things are mutually exclusive. And if you're if, if you're gonna live in the state where where you want to hold those two things for yourself, right? Like you're bullshitting yourself, right? Like you're you're recognizing the trade-off, but you're not willing to accept it. And um, that 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 is that is definitely bad framing, right? Like in an, another way to, to look at bad framing is 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 a, a paradox, right? Like where you where you think like okay, these these things can't exist together, right? But that that just means that that you're missing a piece, right? And that piece is probably within participation, right? Like because because it, it 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 requires you to have a specific type of insight and and i've i've been saying from the early days like i think religion is is like a structure that allows you to transcend paradoxes and and so so there's this this affordance that that the transformation that gives you that 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 you can you, you can straighten those paradoxes and 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 hold these things in in the tension that that they're supposed to be or maybe not even intention at all, um, and and so 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 that what are we talking about? Well, no, now we're talking about intellectual uh, honesty and and uh, carefulness, or or or, or uh, what's, what's the right word? Anyway, yeah, you 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 want to have you want to take seriously. The, yourself and 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 the con concepts that you're holding, and um, when when you when you get into these situations, right, you should immediately uh, enter in a state of humility and say, okay, like there's definitely something going on that I don't I don't I don't I'm not aware of, and now I'm I'm gonna have to figure that out, and and until I'm there, I'm just gonna hold everything as uh malleable so like like it, it 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 is it is in need of update yeah yeah i like that i think yeah religion also gives you a container for transformation right it gives you a contain and containers give you orientation right they give you all that ability to orient based on the constraints in the container and constraints are important because without constraints we don't have contrast without contrast we can't see and and the constraints allow us to orient and see both separately, independently, and 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 give us a space so that if our transformation goes wrong, right, we can find out, right? We can it's pointed to by the by the constraints of the container and by the aim of the container, roughly speaking, or the aims available in the container. It also allows other people to help us because they can locate us in the container and they can lend their agency. Right, and and they can support us while we're breaking down our worldview to go through transformation. Because so I think that's a very important part of of transformation. And and as a culture, we need to take our cultural cognitive grammar and transform it to something that conforms with clear boundaries, clear contrast, clear clear constraints, back into a way to communicate in common. Because right now we're not we're not communicating in common. We're we're communicating kind of all over the place and and yeah the, the religious framing basically gives us a, a a master frame to deal with these paradoxes with contradiction understanding that you're in a contradiction but i i think and and, and it also helps with intellectual honesty because in the in the view in a in a world view where you're a small speck of created you know life uh, amongst a lot of other created life, there's, you know, however many billion people on the planet, right? Six, seven, who knows, five, something like that, a lot. Uh, more than I can conceive of, that's for sure. Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a world on just one planet where you're stuck with billions of people and there's something out there that created it all, that can help engender humility so that you can I get that intellectual honesty because one of the problems with intellectual honesty is it's another one of those things that people use. Say, you need to be more intellectually honest. It's like, no, no, no. I need to be more intellectually honest with myself first. 
And then we can talk about intellectual honesty of everybody else. Because if you want people to be intellectually honest with you, you have to exemplify. And that's really where the problem comes in. It's like, if what you exemplify is anger and resentment, you're going to get anger and resentment back. If what you exemplify is intellectual honesty, you're going to get more intellectual honesty. And I, I sort of saw this last night on, on, on Clubhouse. I, I went in and I said, look, these development models are cute, but it seems like people slide back. And I know we talked about this on Clubhouse on, on Monday. We do a, a meeting Monday, uh, Monday at 12, uh, 12 Eastern, right, on Clubhouse um, in, in, you know, in, our, in, our little, uh, in our little Clubhouse room. Um, and, and meeting Mondays are great, but I went over it again, right? I went over the whole thing again. And I said, look, I, there's a bunch of people I know were good critical thinkers. Some of them taught me how to think critically about things. They taught this skill to me. And now they no longer possess it themselves. I mean, that, act, that actually happens. And then somebody spoke up and said, no, that actually happened to, to a person. I, I, I forget if it was an aunt or, or something like it was, some, it was a relative of hers. She's like, she was a scientist. She was actually very critical. And now she's stuck actually believing what Rachel Maddow says on MSNBC. It's like, whoa, that's a big change. It's a big change. And we don't recognize that because we're not intellectually honest with ourselves but we expect it from others. And, and we need to exemplify the things we want from others. And, and if we're sending out anger and resentment and, and oh, woe is me, and oh, I, this is bad, and this happened to me, and you know, look, I got sob stories for days. So if you wanna play the sob story game, I'm probably gonna win. Uh, but I, I, you know, I try not to do that. I don't, well, I was homeless, so I know way more about homelessness than you do. And occasionally I have to pull that card, but I don't start there. <laughs> I don't, I don't think that's fair, right? Um, I, I don't start with, you know, look, I got a house taken from me, right? Like, actually, I had two uh, under different circumstances. I, I, I don't start there. Uh, why? I'm trying to exemplify intellectual honesty. I'm trying to exemplify critical thinking. I'm trying to exemplify a way in which you can understand the world better with simpler models, right? And, and, and easier participation and better intimacy, ultimately, which is where I think this is going to lead. Um, is that is that intimacy and and that's where cultural cognitive grammar is so important because if we don't fix that we end up not being able to communicate effectively and it's that ineffective communication back to the tower of babel that that's the real core of the problem with sense making right we're, we're, we don't have effective communication and and that's part but not all of uh the sense making crisis yeah so talking about this this container of of religion, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna flip it again because I'm in the flip day today, which is really funny. But okay, so then you're in your individualist individualistic container. So now you have a problem, or, or even worse, you're going through a transformation. And how is someone supposed to help you? Right? Like like are, are they gonna climb into your container and like? like participate in your lived experience and, and then validate your perspective and then affirming your trend transformation like like that that like at that point you're you're playing a game where well yeah what what, what can you do well you can say yes or no to to what what the other person is doing and and then like that the other person always has the rebuttal like yeah but you're not in my container and therefore you're not authoritative and um, and then while you, you you can you can bind together with a with a, a set group of people who are having a a similar problem and and having a local solution a similar local solution and then you get you get a local affirmation of of okay right like the thing that i'm doing is correct and everybody right like this is what what they call the bubbles right like everybody is validating your perspective because they're all there because well like we can translate the problem that you're having into a value right like they're organized around the same value so, 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 so then, it when when you're all pointing at the same value, you, you you're gonna you're gonna have a a a level of coherence, and 
and maybe even a set of solutions, right? Like that makes sense in relation to that value, right? But then we go back to the thing again. It's like, okay, but you can't live on one value in life, right? Like when, when you live on one value, you get out of balance. And then at a certain point, like you stop to be able to, to function and, and cohere to reality. Um, and and it, it doesn't matter what, what value, you have although some values right like we can look at the trans community right like they require transformation right which which is really intense while other values allow you to to maintain more of a separate identity right like if they're not pointed inwards for example but pointed outwards that that is a that that is a more durable game but Again, right, like because it's a more durable game, you can play it longer before the world falls apart, right? Like, and we're all like Wally Coyote running up the cliff, right? And then the question is, well, like, like how many people are going to fall off that cliff and how bad is that going to be? Um, yeah, who knows? Yeah, I like that. I like the way you frame that. Yeah, the, the whole idea of the containers, the shared space that you can occupy with shared constraints and shared. Um, uh, shared shared uh, space of values and virtues, right? A shared space of aims. Uh, and then that's the only way you're going to do it because otherwise you're going to create a bubble. So how do you create a bubble? You find people that agree with you on all fronts with very little or no conflict, right? And then that's just going to inflate because you're, you're going to pump each other up continuously. And then eventually that's going to burst though. And then that's going to be painful. And that's what people are, are running into, right? Which is why you need a container that has nothing to do with just you or just your value or just a value or just one set of values, right? It has to, it has to do with other people's conceptions of these same things and, and an agreed set of constraints so that people can get to that space with you. And that space is already bigger than say you and the other people in it. <clears throat> and that's the real key, right? Now we're back to Plato's forms and the IDOS Right, which I think is a much better way to think about it. And, and that's so much bigger than the people in it that it can't be a bubble because you can't inflate it because it's already way bigger than you can understand. And yeah, I think that's super important. So, so I, I, I like that. But having these containers and understanding which containers those containers are in is, is really important because a lot of these containers are arbitrary. So you can, you, can, you can gene up a container called economics, but I think Nassim Taleb is quite correct. Read all his books. He's awesome. Easy read. Um, when when he starts talking about you know economics, the, the economists are fraud. Like they, they're just committing fraud all the time because they, they they can't predict the things they say. It's all post post facto, right? Post hoc rationalization. It's all looking back. None of it's able able to have any predictive power or prescriptive power or or limited prescriptive power anyway. Um, and they don't recognize, you know, say, the limitations of their own of their own bucket. And you, know, you can see you can see that problem everywhere. People aren't recognizing the limitations of their containers. Like, science has limitations, and this is one of the points I was making in Clubhouse last night. One of the limitations of science is if something's new, science doesn't know anything about it, definitionally, because science relies on observation. So it has to not be new for a while, and then and then after it's not new, people have to come up with ideas and then those ideas have to be formed with hypotheses and then those hypotheses have to be tested. Now we have science. Before that, we don't have science. And so you need a bunch of observations to even get to that point. And so new and novel viri don't fit that criteria. So you can't science them yet because they're too new. <laughs> you need a lot of data to start science. You need a lot of observations to start science. And then you need ideas, right? You can go, oh, well, there's some previous science. Okay, well, show me the previous science and, and show me Show me the new, quote, new science, right? And, and see if they match. Um, and, and that's a problem is that if you don't recognize the limits of these things, you'll, you'll try to apply them. And I, I know, you know, people talk a lot about, well, what we need is, is a different kind of rationality. I don't think that exists. Like, we just need different sense-making skills. Like, the sense-making skill where somebody tells you something that is accessible for you to enact in the world, to participate in directly, and you participate in it, and it works for you. That's good sense making, right? As opposed to somebody just telling you something and you can't participate or it doesn't lead to anything or the fact of its existence 
can only frustrate you or make you angry or sad or whatever, right? Or can only justify your already existing feeling about it or something. That that's not helpful. That's not helpful. That that's bad sense making in essence. That's bad sense making, and and that's the the distinction is. The bubbles don't exist in a large enough container, but it's easy to get into bubbles because they're comfortable, but then they inflate and they take you out and it may take years or it may only take months. doesn't matter. You're going to get taken out by that because it's not big enough to hold all the things it needs to hold. Yeah. So, so we're, we're talking about a bunch, bunch of things, right? So we, we, we started off with sense making. Um, so we're doing sense making in a frame and I'm, I'm still not sure about whether the frame has has the grammar inherent in it or not um because because i think i think the grammar is also dependent on on your skills right so you might be in a frame but, but you don't have the capacity to fully uh inhabit the frame well the frame uh, the frame affects your your meaning Right, because I've done words and meaning, <laughs> and it's content plus context, and content part of context. If you know a good part of context is framing, right? right. And so, yeah, it's going to affect the grammar because that's part of the grammar is the context. Right, uh, but but so so the frame is is erected as a consequence of a value um, because that that is that is informing why it is there and 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 the way it is there um so so that 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 is important to recognize when 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 you're when you're evaluating your your cognition or 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 the way that someone else is cognizing in front of you right so so one of the advices i give to people is when 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 you're talking to someone right there or someone is talking to you they want something right like they're they're trying to achieve something of value to them and it is important for you to relate to what they value and to provide them answers in relationship to that value and as long as you're not doing that this situation is meaningless right like mm. you you will literally frustrate the situation so um and and then the second thing i say is like okay you're you're not aware of or, or the other person is probably not aware of what they value and and you're not aware of what they value right so what do you want to do well you want to establish what what is what is this conversation about like why does this conversation exist and then when you have a agreement around what is valuable in the conversation you can erect the same frame as that other person or at least a, a close enough frame and and now you can have a conversation about how to fill in that frame and and how to evaluate the things within the frame in relation to the value right like you, you evaluate like I, I don't even know what evaluate means anyway yeah so um so it's it it if if you're constructing your conversation in that way you're playing a whole different ball game right and then well you can obviously do this all the time right but uh but if if there is something of value, right, and, and you can sense that in the conversation, right, because then there's an emotional component that, that is being present, then this is the way that you can resolve it, right? And it, like, if, if people are looking for emotional validation, like maybe the right solution for that conversation is, is to shut it up, right? Like don't, don't engage around that value because what you're going to say is not going to be heard in the way that it is it is intended and you you're only going to rub against that person's um sense of self uh because because they're committed to that aspect and and then you can you can just instead of entering into the conflict you can 
disrupt that conversation and steer it into something that is related to a different value. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah, and, and there has to be a way in which you can understand, say, something that's too comfortable, right? Or something that doesn't have enough conflict to ring true, right? It's too too agreeable in a sense. And um, I know I've said this before, like the only honest man is a disagreeable one, right? Uh, because they, you, know, you have to be willing to conflict with people uh, in order to tell the truth. And you know, maybe that hurts. Um, <clears throat> but if you don't do it, you can't engender the truth. You can't, you can't go after the, those highest virtues and values because there'll be a mismatch between those virtues and values and you know, where you are in your bubble. And we, we all have these little bubbles that, that we're in and we, and we should be actively fighting them. What do I feel most comfortable about today? Hmm, maybe, maybe I need to do something about that, right? Have I ever had this idea challenged? How well can I articulate my ideas? Because a lot of people have great ideas and then they go to articulate them and their ideas don't sound so great. And the problem is if it's an idea that requires a participation beyond yourself, so like, oh, I want to fix the world, um, you better be able to articulate it to other people, otherwise you're in trouble. And if the only people you articulate it to are people in a bubble, that's not going to help because you can't get everybody in your bubble because some people are in different, different bubble or different containers. And I think that's the problem is this idea of nested containers. Um, and, and, you know, just having that concept because we, we tend to, to boil things down, right? We go, Oh, okay. Well, there's one, there's one lens. We have one lens. It's like, no, no, no. we have lots of lenses and we need to be able to flip between them. Otherwise we become trapped in these narratives. Right. If, if, if you're not doing that. And so some things will make sense, but some things won't make sense anymore. And that's really important and interesting to know. Maybe the reason why I can't articulate my ideas to somebody else is because they don't make sense. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> but they make sense to me. Oh, that's a worse problem. That means it could be a framing issue. And if I can't break out of my framing, maybe my idea just is wrong. <laughs> maybe it's just not going to work. And because again, if it only works for you and your little group of agreeable people, um, but you need more people than that to make it work, maybe it's not useful. And and that's where we get where we get caught up. You know, where, where you get capitalism turns into this magical uh, mind control space dragon. Yeah. So so what you're talking about there is is okay. So I have a group of people, and we're we're all in agreement about something, and because we have this disagreement we have a affordance in our relationship that that allows us to be with each other in a certain way right so now that we have we have that being with each other in a certain way we might make conclusions about the nature of reality right but what you're experiencing is a consequence of the nature of the affordance, not a consequence of the nature of reality. And, and that's, that's where, where you get into trouble, right? So then, then there, there, there's two, two problems, right? Like, is, is the thing real or is the thing only existing because people are are there to get some emotional validation and thereby they are also validating you right so so, so that 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 is literally an illusion right and then like is 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 that so, so then like that doesn't even exist right and then like is 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 the relationship of those people like a relationship that they have with you or are they having a relationship with the value and 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 the fact that you're there is is, is you're literally just a sideshow character in in relation to to what 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 they can get out of that value right so now you step out of this bubble and, and I, I had this maxim i think <laughs> like don't apply the rules from inside your bubble outside your bubble um like this this is a moment to to, to rub that one in um but yeah you step outside of your bubble and then okay like people don't react the way that the people inside of your bubble are reacting well not like that that just seems natural right like because that's why it's a bubble <laughs> like like that that's the nature of the bubble and then 
then you you can you can you can take three positions there, right? Like you can say, well, like we need to have everybody conform to my bubble uh, so that we can do the bubble thing. <laughs> um, that the person doesn't realize the goodness of whatever I have inside of my bubble and I need to be enlightened into the goodness or or you're you're gonna have to uh, like basically drop your your worldview <laughs> and and realign with with the space outside of your bubble which is gonna be uh, a traumatic event for you because like yeah like that is you having to give up to to that value that you hold dear because um so so yeah like i i think i think that might be a good description of of of, of that process right and it's like so maybe we should flip that around and what would be the right relationship right like because because like yeah you're gonna be in a bubble anyway right like uh because because just familiarity creates uh, a set of affordances that aren't there with other people, right? So, so, so that means that you're going to have to act differently with people you know and people you don't know. Um, so, so the right relationship would be where the tension between you acting within your bubble and outside of your bubble is minimal, right? So you want to end up cohering to a, a set of universal expressions that, or, or, or heuristics in, in, in the way that you, you engage with, with things that, that are, are independent of, of who you're interfacing with. And, and that universality, right? Like that, that brings the reliance back onto you and your relationship as opposed to the person that you're relating to. Yeah, and I think I want to be <clears throat> a little fair, right? So intersubjectivity and agreement, right, which is what intersubjectivity is based on, is a form of sense making. Oh, other people agree with me, right? Because we outsource our sanity, because we're, we're looking out constantly. We can't can't look inward very well, or maybe at all. Uh, if you're not meditating, you're definitely not even looking inward at all. Um, so there's a way in which that's a form of sense making, is having a bubble, it's having intersubjective agreement, having other people agree with you. That's, that's but I would call that weak sense making again, because it has to be participatory, it has to participate with lots of people, not just people with which you already agree. That's not helpful. Um, <clears throat> I know I've mentioned this before. I'm always I'm always concerned when I don't get pushback and my ideas, did they understand them, <laughs> right? Be, or, or am I wrong and everyone's just afraid to tell me, right? Because that happens too, right? And so you always want some pushback to, to know that, that someone's looking at this as seriously as you are. And, and that doesn't mean they have to disagree. Right, they can just push back and just be a question like, "Are you sure that X or can you explain Y?" Right, because if you're not able to do that, right, so so let's we'll use one of my favorite one of my favorite kick boys is game A game B. Right, and I ask these game A game B people all the time, "How's that going to work?" That's all. Like, it's not. I'm not challenging them. I'm just asking. Like, look, if your idea is good, and and again, I don't even think it's wrong. If your idea is good. Uh, not not just right, but also good, then how are we going to do this? And if you don't have an answer to that, there's a problem. Like, like you can have all the, the right answers you want, but if they're not implementable, it's a problem. And so asking, asking them, well, how's that going to work? What, what do I do? How do I participate in making it happen? And the fact that they never, ever have an answer at all, or at least a practical, you know, implementable answer that I can do means that I can't participate with them. And, and so, you know, they all think they've got an idea that's great. And they all think that, oh, we're just going to implement this. Uh, but they don't have an implementation. They don't even have a theoretical implementation, right, that anybody can actually participate in. They, they have a bunch of theories about how 
magical incentives work or something, which you know, is not how incentives work. I mean, you know, great dictators know how to do incentives, uh, but that's the only way to do incentives as near as I can tell. So no thanks, uh, I'm out. Uh, and people constantly, well, the government incentivizes you by paying you or the government incentivizes you by telling you things or whatever. Yeah. And then you go to America where you know, almost nobody will ever, you know, people go, oh, you're incentivizing me for something. I'm definitely not doing that. Right. Because it's just it's that rebel spirit. It's that Protestant ethos everywhere in the United States. And so yeah, it works for some people, but it doesn't work for enough people. And almost zero incentive plans work for enough people. And incentives often backfire. That's in uh, Freakonomics. It's a great, great series of books. Read all the Freakonomics books. Man, if you want to understand critical thinking and, and how stupid you are about the world and how little you know and how much you're a Muppet, read the Freakonomics books. I think there's three or four of them. I forget. Um, but man, some of the stuff in there, and they talk about you know incentive systems so that it's one of the, it's in the first Freakonomics book even, I, I think. Right. Oh, well, there's a daycare and people keep coming late. So what they do is they go, all right, well, what we're going to do, is we're going to charge everybody an extra, an extra $50 or something. I forget the exact amount for every 15 minutes late they are. And then what happens? More people pick up their kids later. How's your incentive plan working now? It just turns out that once you place a monetary value on it, people can now evaluate it without feeling guilty because they have a, a, a way to buy away their guilt, which is the $50 or, or whatever the fee is, right? And so now that they can relate to it differently, even though you change the incentive from zero, zero penalty, zero physical material penalty in the world for picking up your kid late from daycare to an actual penalty, the, the penalty people care about is in their head, whether or not they feel guilty. And so once you made it acceptable, and made a trade-off there that works, they, they didn't feel guilty anymore. So more people picked up their kids late and just paid the extra money. And, and this happens all the time. So you think you understand incentives and how to get people to do things. And it turns out that it doesn't work that way. That's not the way the world works. This is an economic model and economic models, as I pointed out earlier, are wrong. Like the world doesn't operate on economics. Economics only works when you look after things have happened. It doesn't work prescriptively or, or predictively. Yeah, there was this guy who landed his uh, helicopter in front of the supermarket or whatever, right? He was like, yeah, I'll just pay the fine, right? <laughs> so that, that's the really, really common behavior. Um, because what do you do, right? Like, yeah, you, you now establish two comparable value hierarchies. And, and yeah, like when 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 you're relating to potential or or to other values right like because what what is guilt right like guilt is some sort of uh, consistency uh sense that you have in yourself and transgressing against your consistency should weigh more than paying 50 bucks right so so yeah those those, those people are are, are Correct in 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 that level of sense making, right? And so, so this this brings me into okay. So, so there's there's obviously a frame in which those people were relating to the situation, and and they can change they can change that frame, right? Like they could have intentionally done that as well, but like the the incentive imposed that relationship on them in in some sense right and i think i think that that is what the purpose of an incentive is it is imposing a relationship and then having an expectation that that relationship will result in the specific behavior um but uh but yeah like like we have that capacity to have that relationship towards ourselves as well and uh and that's 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 where where we can we can potentially do do some magic right so so if if we we find out our own grammar right like our own sense making structure then we we can uh, have uh intercessions is that the word uh, yeah i think that's the word so so we can intercede at at a level in our sense making so that 
later behaviors don't manifest or will manifest more more likely right and 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 in some sense we're talking about steering uh, our manifestation through our sense making structure right and 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 that's that's where, where you want to get at right like that that gives you a level of agency um through your your cognitive grammar that i think it, it is 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 the is the thing that we value um and 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 we're trying to get at so so um yeah that that's maybe a, a little bit of motivation i don't think we want to go too deep in that but yeah <laughs> like that that's out there guys yeah no i like that idea right because <clears throat> again it's all about having these containers large enough containers that are so big that they can't they can't be inflated basically because they're they're already Bigger, way bigger than, than that. And, and they're common spaces that people can adopt and, and agree to constraints, at, at least for the purpose of, of agreeing to constraints so that you can, you can cooperate with people. And then again, there's a sense in which there's virtues and values there that are, that are manifest or aimable. And then you can orient right in that direction and that increases the odds that the thing you're trying to manifest will manifest. And that's actually super, that's, that's the super important part, right? That the ability to manifest the things you want to manifest. And it's okay that the constraints are there because they allow you to do the manifestation. And there's some set of trade-offs for sure, uh, but you need those in order to have the contrast to see so that you can orient, right? And then, it, or you, you know, navigation is all about orientation. It's all about orientation and then taking action. So you want to nudge those actions in the right direction, imperfectly though, though you may have to, right? And then once you've done that, it's like, oh, right? Like, oh, okay. So there's a way in which I can control the grammar that I'm using and, and control the way I, I'm, I'm sending out that signal, right? And to try to manifest the right thing or, or, or right discernment or right relationship, all, all of these things at once. And, and that is about stating your container clearly. You know, I, I, think, I think economics is a bad frame, right? I, I think po politics is a bad frame. Just never use it. You don't need to. Um, you know, there's lots of arguments why it's definitely a bad frame, uh, why it's definitely counterproductive, and why it can't provide answers. It's too simple. It's too simple. And, and it inflates itself. Like the political machine inflates itself. Right. This is why governments get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger um, without without any relationship to anything important or useful or, or, or manifest in the world. And that's a bubble like po politics is its own little bubble. And yeah, it generates its own its own weather or whatever. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can use that fact to solve anything um, because it, that's it's, that's just a maelstrom of problems. And you know, maybe they have, some of them have to be dealt with, but maybe they can't be dealt with within that frame. And they have to be dealt with within a larger container, right? A, a, more, a more religious container maybe, right? Or, or a container that, that at least has virtues and values in it, which politics cannot have, uh, right? You can't legislate morality. Uh, the famous, famous, famously, people keep trying and failing. And they've been doing it for thousands of years, well-documented. Um, and, and that's the issue is that, you need to manifest riches and values independently in your own container, and hopefully, it's a common container. Right, and and I, I think that that is an important part, right? Like the you wanna you wanna manifest those values, and and those ma those values are the thing that manifest the containers. Um, so if if you wanna like like politics is not a value, right? Like politics is a frame that allows you to have a understanding potentially of certain dynamics within the world but but that is that is not the realm of action the, the realm of action is is in relation to your value and and the manifestation of the value and then the the values are also not connected to uh to the physical manifestation that that they take right so one of my bugaboos lately is is this idea of, of status right like like status can be manifested in in many ways right so you 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 can have status in relation to the women in the group you can have status in relation to the man in the group and sometimes they overlap sometimes they don't and sometimes they conflict right so so 
when even when you value status right like that does not directly inform your behavior because the complexity of of the space that you're relating to and and the potential manifestations and, and like you don't have only that value you also have other values like uh, i don't know like getting home and laying on the couch or whatever right and and sometimes those take primacy over 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 your your social status right so so the reducing these 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 concepts into a a specific manifestation and then having it as explanatory is reducing the complexity of the situation and thereby disabling you to navigate that situation correct and and so, so that is that is the thing that i i uh, i want to warn for like okay so so if we have a frame then that frame needs to be in relation to a value and and that value is something that is not in the world and um, and when we start confusing what is in the world with the value then we start having a different set of problems right and, and now we can we can go back to to the sense making part right like well we can check we can check our sense making right like is 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 our concept or or, or of of what what's happening is is that also fight right like am i certain of of the thing or or do i have room for the potential and and, and different manifestations of it and and that is that maybe that that goes back to the value of the container as such right like that is the value that we need to hold over the value that we're we're trying to pursue in the moment Oh, I like that. I like that. Yeah, yeah. So it, what's occurred to me here is, you know, we we talk a lot about, um, and I, I have yet to do a video on this, but it's coming. It's on the list. Um, maps, which are descriptive, versus models, which can be prescriptive or predictive. And then the reason, so I, I, I suspect there's an infinite number of descriptive maps for anything. <clears throat> you know, or at least there's a combinatorial explosively huge number so take something like economics and you know there's probably an infinite number of economic models that work uh because there's a bunch of explanations you can have for the math basically so the math doesn't have to change you can have a bunch of explanations for why the math went the way it went um but because it's all descriptive and it's all post facto it's all after the fact all of it um i think it's fair to say um there's no way to know what story happened at the moment right or or what interactions happened that were part of a story because things just cohere in the world sometimes and so when you're doing sense making um it's easy to make sense of a description because and there's lots of them and that that you know we touched on that earlier right but there's a sense that you should have about your participation in the thing right and so because we live in this objective material reality world where we're told that the objective material reality is a thing and and we can inhabit it which both of which are false and maybe I'll, I'll do a video on objective material reality at some point. Um, that, that's coming. That's definitely got to got to go there. Um, I think that what happens is we try to we try to do that. We try to sit there, and then we're not bothered by the fact that we can't participate in something. That we're just spectators all of a sudden because we're hanging out in objective material reality. So, of course, I can't you know be Elon Musk, and that's because the capitalist you know, mind control space dragon has everybody worried about profit instead of my awesome talent in the world, right? Obviously. And, and, and that's, where the, that's where the problem comes in is that it's, it's very comfortable to sit there. But what we want to do is engage with prescriptive and predictive models because those models should have enough potential and enough uncertainty, actually. You want uncertainty in those models, not total uncertainty, obviously, you don't want zero, right? But you want some uncertainty so that there's different ways in which you feel that you could participate, right? And that others can participate because if it's, again, if it's just you, that now you're in a bubble again, right? So you want to understand the relationship of the participation in these things. And so again, if if you see a mob and you assume there's only one type of person in the mob and that they all had the same single goal, 
that's probably not reflective of reality, right? You need to ask yourself, well, what is the, what are the possible participations? How would I have participated if I were in that mob, right? Without being heroic, we'll say, right? Just like, what, what would I do if, if I was in a mob and somebody broke a window? Like, would I also break a window? Because that happened a lot in Seattle, um, right? Would I throw, once somebody, once one person throws a rock, throwing rocks becomes acceptable to some extent, right? And then that snowballs. And so that's not directed. There's a story you can tell about that. There's probably an infinite number of stories you can tell about that. But what happened in the moment was somebody just got frustrated or figured that they were going to rabble rouse or had had some plan that well, once we throw rocks at the building as part of you know some operation to uh, get back at the feds, now we can go loop, which would like that definitely happens. That happens all the time, actually. Um, I know people who have implemented these things, or you can watch video of you know, people giving people bricks and things like that. And, and then you know destruction starts. And the purpose of the destruction is, well, there's destruction here and here. These two destructions are different. These guys are looting. These guys are, are fighting the power or you know, whatever they're being anarchists, whatever, whatever nonsense they're up to, right? And so you can see a way in which there's multiple ways to participate. So you can't be certain about what the mob's doing and why, right? But you can be certain that there's a way to participate in a mob. And that's a better way of sense making. What could my participation be? I think we've taken participation out with this OMR, with this objective material reality, which is very much the realm of science. And so now we're not connected to anything anymore. So we've lost intimacy. But when you lose intimacy, you lose the most important sense making, which is the sense making about how you fit into the things around you. And that's the real key. How do I fit? How do I make sense? How am I in this world? What is it that I do that affects the world? And what things that the world, that happen in the world affect me? And what is that relationship? Because that's all about intimacy. Yeah, and, and just going to the mob idea, right? Like you you don't judge the mob by its average, right? Like that's not the relevant part, right? Like there might be 10% or even less of the mob that are manifesting a specific type of behavior, but that's that's the part that you need to relate to. That That is the part that's gonna affect you and it's gonna affect the world. And the fact that there's other people in there is irrelevant. Like those, those people do not matter. And is it, this is true for other groups as well, right? Like when you relate to a group, right? Like you might have to relate to the leader and the thought leader or, right? Like, and, and, and there's, there's only certain aspects that, that are relevant for you to relate to. And when you're relating outside of that relevancy, like, what are you doing? Like, okay, you're convincing someone who isn't manifesting anything in the world. So like, like you, you, you're changing the opinion of an in, irrelevant person. Um, so there, there's, there's this aspect where, where a group, uh, what was the word again? Like, what was that? Joe used it. Um, the mob. Well, in 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 the Roman legions, there was there was this this one person that was the spokesperson, right? Like that that you'd speak to, <laughs> and 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 they they'd be the spoke piece for the group, right? And they they mm -hmm. had they had that systematized and organized as 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 a physical role. So, so it's, it's interesting that that these these things were there, right? And and like people actually physically manifested these these aspects because they they realized literally and figuratively the necessity of of having these these aspects uh, in in a body. So and and that role was was uh, separate from from the centurion, I think. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, like, so, so, so when, when, when we have the container, um, the container is, uh, a thing that, that, that works on different levels, right? So we have, we have the, the big, 
container which which contains everything and then and then we have the smaller containers which which are related to to uh, values and i think i think those well, what would you say the middle container? Well, they, they relate to your identity, I think. Yeah, right. Like so, so that that is like your identities. Um, right? Well, yes, right. Like it, you, you don't have one identity, but yeah. So, so, so it 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 is important to to get get some some relationship to to those containers as well, um, and and uh, maybe take take a lesson from from the Romans, right? And, and then start start institutionalizing your relationship to your container, right? Like, okay, like I'm, I'm ritualizing, for example, going outside of the door, right? Like when you're an outside of the door person, there's a different set of rules, right? And so you can make that transition, include a, a mental transition in into that new identity. Um, and 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 then you making those things ritualized and 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 conforming those rituals around the purposes of of the new identity is in in one one way enchanting your world to go back to to the enchanting aspect right but it it is also preparing you to be a better version of the the, the the person inhabiting that container and and the fact that 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 you're having that conscious relationship with your container right like allows you to to realize what that when you're in a container that you're not familiar with that you have a relationship to that container and then you can inform that relationship to that container in the moment yeah, and I think that goes back to your bugaboo of identity and status, right? Yeah, you have an identity in every container you're in, and those identities are different, and they conflict because that's how it works, and that sucks. But you you have to you have to be willing to submit to the idea of container, to the constraints of each individual container, to the fact that in different containers you have different identities, and therefore different statuses, right? Like, look, if I if I if I go somewhere. And there's people talking about computers. My status is very different than if I go somewhere and people are talking about religion because I don't know anything about religion, right? I'm not a, not a theologian at all, right? And so <clears throat> necessarily my status can be different. Now, that doesn't mean I'm gonna have a low status in either case, right? Um, but it's different. And so the idea of status and also status has changed. Like people, everything's static, right? Everything's, and why is everything static? Because again, they're trying to be OMR. Right. And then why are they trying to reduce everything to one identity? OMR. They want to be in this objective material reality frame all the time so that they can relate to things the way they want to. It's all my relationship to everything else. Right. But that's not intimate. That's a one way connection where you're treating the world like a vending machine and trying to get what you want out of it. And so, oh, my status is I'm the guy with the most podcast people. And therefore, you, you, I'm interviewing you, not the other way around, right? Or, or I'm the one that asks the questions here, or, you know, whatever it is. And like, fair enough. Maybe that's true. Maybe that's not the way it has to be. Doesn't really matter. It matters, though, that you acquiesce to the fact that there is status. Just because you have a status doesn't mean you'll keep it. Other people have status and status can change. Like, oh, right. And also, your status here and your status there are different. And in every container you're in, it's different. Like your relationship to your father and your relationship to some person of the same age who's not related to you is different. And it's supposed to be different. And you have different identities in those cases because you do. It's just a, a, a hard fact of reality, right? It's something you can't really get around. And it's correct because it's important because otherwise the world's just this flat, boring space. And, and that's what gives us to nihilism is this, when we shrink, try to shrink everything down and relate to it from objective material reality, which doesn't exist, um, then, then we lose the intimacy. We've cut all the intimacy out. Everything's a one-way connection and we expect a vending machine for the world. But we really need to get into these containers that can help us to relate to our own identity and our own status and also relate to the conflicts 
within. And to your point, like, look, maybe you're a little worker bee in some structure. Maybe it's a volunteer structure. Maybe it's your work. Maybe it's a hobby that you have. Maybe it's a group of people you're, you're doing a book, book club with or whatever. Maybe it's a meditation group. doesn't matter. Um, acquiescing to that helps the group right? Not trying to be something that you maybe can't be or shouldn't be. Like maybe you have better skills, but no one cares, right? People may not care that you're the best administrator in the world, right? They may only care if you're the most um, articulate person, or they may only care if, you know, you, your interface with people is friendly, right? And I've, I've talked about this before, I, you know, there's, there's been groups where, you have, especially engineers tend to have lock, lock horns a lot, right? It's like, oh, no, my implementation is better. No, my implementation is better. They both lead to the same thing. So the implementations are equal by any reasonable measure, right? But one engineer wants to do, his, do it his way. The other engineer wants to do it his way. And then there's a, a, a person in the group who is not an engineer or has the title of engineer, but isn't very good at it, but super nice guy. And then every time he's in the meeting, they don't fight. Why? Because he's exemplifying something for them. He's not helping on the technical side. I've seen this many times, by the way. This happens all the time in computers. He's not helping anything like from a technical perspective, but him being there and being friendly and nice and talking people down and, and you know having that skill, even though he's not in charge either, uh, sometimes they are, but often they're not in charge, um, makes everything work. And it, it's kind of magical. It's like, well, you know, the, the boss should be able to do that. The boss can't do that. In some cases, sometimes, sometimes yes, but in some cases, and, and is that the best way for the boss to constantly call out one engineer or the other? Because then it's like, well, you know, you're always making one engineer unhappy as the boss. That's no good. If you can do that without making people unhappy because they're exemplifying this nice guy who's in the room, that seems like a better solution, right? Because then no one, no one gets upset. No one's feathers have been ruffled. No hard decisions have been made by anybody. The power hasn't come down from the top and knocked you over. Um, and, and so there's a way in which you have to acquiesce to your role in the structure and your role is not determined entirely by you. And it's not determined entirely by you and your skills. And it's not determined entirely by you, your skills and your desires. It's not determined entirely by you, your skills, your desires and, and where you think you should be. Like it's not determined by that. And you have to acquiesce to that, submit to that so that you can be more efficient in the structure because the more you fight it, the worse it is for everybody else too. And that's one of the things we don't like. People who are inherently disagreeable, like like myself, uh, tend to tend to disrupt structures quite a bit. And sometimes you know, that's what I'm paid for. So sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's not what I'm paid for. It's not good. Uh, if if I make a mistake and do it anyway, uh, which I try not to, but you know, whatever. I'm a people, so I'm all up it too. So there is a way in which this is linked to identity and status and containers, and all of that is super important because. That re, you know, re enchants and, and gives us back the possibility and potential and the intimacy. Because when we're not fighting against the structures we're part of, when we're trying to get in right relationship to them instead and use proper discernment, who knows what will manifest? Yeah. So I, I wanted to add like, if, if the king comes to me and he's looking for some wisdom that I have, then what is our relationship? Right? Like, who's on top? So the relationship is a consequence of the way that that people are in relation to what's being valued, right? And, and the, the king is, is at that moment coming and he's deciding what's being valued, but that implies a dependence and, and that is primary in that situation. And well, you, you, in some fairy tales, you see that, right? You see the, the people uh, making use of that, right? I think uh, Democles or something, right? Like he said to Alexander, like, like uh, Alexander was like, I, I'd like to be you or something. And he's like, yeah, I'd like to be me as well or something. <laughs> so so there, there's all of these these things where, 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 and, and this, 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 is, is relating to charisma and authority. And it's like, okay, like I now have right relationship to the container and to the situation. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not using the implied social structure to, to navigate my standing. I'm, I'm using this, the spirit of the situation to, to realize right relationship to, to what I'm, I'm engaged with. And 
and this this goes this goes into the intimacy right so so okay like in in order to gain all these skills right like you you need to have that awareness that that you're in these things right and like i'm, I'm not trying to make a propositional argument here but like you need to have that intuitive sense and 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 then you, you also have to have the acceptance and 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 that submission right and then the the intimacy can come forth as as a consequence of of the ways of participating that that open up uh by by you being receptive um right and 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 why why i'm saying being receptive right because because what 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 is the distinction right like if if you're submitted you're not rebelling right and 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 the rebellion thing is is a thing that that puts you in contrast to something else it, mm -hmm. it, it puts you in a relationship and it keeps you stuck in that relationship you're you're unable to transcend that relationship because that relationship gives you your identity like you're not the source of your own identity that relationship gives you the identity right and because that relationship gives you your identity that closes of of set that potential in the world while when when you have that submission to the container and 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 your relationship it aren't defining you right like then you have all this capacity to relate to all of these these potentials in the world and and that that when you have the skill right because that's a requirement right but, and, and 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 that relates to the intimacy as well but but your relationship to all of those potentials right like that's where you get the intimacy and and that's where you you also get that that ways of of manifesting in 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 ways that that are outside of the implied structure that that is presented to you and and this is where you can make miracles happen yeah, I like that. The certainty closes you off from the potential, right? The more certain you are, the less potential there is, right? Those, those have an inverse relationship. And so you want to be in the container, not rebelling, or at least rebelling minimally, uh, right? And, and so that you're opened up to the possibilities outside the container, to all the, not only all the things the container affords, but all the things that the container could afford uh, and the things outside the container can also afford. And there's no other way to do that. And so that sort of squares the circle, uh, at least in my mind, on a container status identity, right? And to some extent, objective material reality and its non-existence and, and why even if it did exist, it would, it, would, it would harm you. Like it's a bad idea to act as if it exists because you lose intimacy, you lose connection. You can't, you lose a whole way of sense making, which is how do I participate? What feels right about my participation in this thing? Because Without the participation, you can't manifest. And without manifestation, it's not going to be a world you're going to live in. Even if you could theoretically live in it, you're not going to live with it in it if you can't participate. And so there is that participatory way of engaging, right? That informing the world that reinflates, re-enchants, you know, all of the all of the world puts the potential there for you to make an intimate, deep connection with it. And it's those deep, intimate connections that that manifest these miracles, roughly speaking, right? These things that are otherwise impossible, otherwise impossible. I think that's a good way to to, to think about it. So, yeah, I mean, I like the I like the way that the cultural cognitive grammar is thinking about these things correctly with a with a, a stable grammar inside of these nice stable containers allows us better sense making through participation. I, I think that's that's the generalized sort of sort of theme and, and conclusion that we've come to. I don't know. How, how do you feel, Manuel? You feeling feeling pretty complete, or or uh, do you want to go deeper on something in particular? Yeah. Well, so I, I think I think we want to rehash a little bit, right? Like so. So the sense making is a thing that's necessary. It is it is happening, right? And the cultural cognitive grammar was was the structure right and 
So we, we kind of went into okay, like what are the substructures that that we can we can use, right? And we go through containers. Um, we we went into frames as well, right? And then how they were constructed, right? From from a value and and how our relationship to that is. So maybe we we want to close up with like a tease of of okay like cool story bro now what right like yeah, maybe we should should go there right and then um it's like okay right we need we need to get that participation going um you need you need to start setting practices right like you need to start gaining some discernment for yourself right like the discernment is in two parts right like one is the discernment for the place for action, right? So you need to create the space within your day that you have a moment where you can implement your action. And then the second one is you need to have the discernment in the manifestation in the world, right? Like, okay, like what what are my options for action? Like, like how do I implement my options for action? And, and those are two levels uh, that you have to relate to. Maybe you want to at a different level but no i i yeah i like that i like um yeah i think that <clears throat> understanding that we have a cultural cognitive grammar and that we need to take care of it and that other people are using that a cultural cognitive grammar to manipulate our behavior is also important and the way you get around that is by understanding framing and containers right what, what is their container what is their framing how are they using these words and then coming up with your own models uh, or, or at least being aware of the models you're using, you're using already to frame things. And so that you can come up with better models and hopefully my models, all right, because I got a lot of them, uh, my models are, are, are helpful for that, right? Because they're nice and simple, uh, relatively speaking, and they, and they allow you a lot of affordances in participation and bringing back this idea of understanding your participation, your connectedness, your intimacy in the potential of whatever it is that's being laid out. And it can be only propositional as long as it has a way for you to participate. But you need to focus on your participation and not focus on trying to be in an objective material reality where you don't matter or where you're not affecting things. Because if you're not affecting things, you're not participating. You're not able to participate in those things. And that's not good. Then it's not a real thing, at least from your perspective, whether, it's, whether it could be real or not is not relevant. Because if something's real and you're not doing it, it's not real to you, <laughs> and, and you know that sucks. And yeah, and that's tough because we're, there's going to be conflict, and we can't avoid conflict by hanging out in, in OMR all day and all night. Like that's not going to work. So you want to bring back that sense of how do I participate in something that <clears throat> can be bigger than even I can imagine, right? That can work in a way that that. That, that I can't even imagine today. And that's where you want to be because that's re-enchanting the world and, and having a deep intimacy with the things and people around you. And yeah, practice, 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 whether it's practice in a meditation group, practice in a church service, practice in, uh, you know, in, in, in a yoga class, right? All these things. And then build relationships from there, outward from there. Because when you meet people, you never know what, what that's going to, you know, how, that, how that's going to change you. And what that's going to do to you. And yeah, it's going to be tough. And some people suck and they're going to say bad things or do bad things. And you have to be careful. Sure. And it requires a lot of discernment, a lot of energy and effort. Absolutely. And a ton of time. But who knows what can manifest from that? And even if it goes badly in the beginning, it could go well, you know, further down the line. Yeah. So uh, one thing I want to pick out there is, is okay, so you're, you're having your grammar, right? So first become aware and then the second one is evaluate right like okay like i have this like what are the implications of me having this um when when you're there right like then you can start making decisions well like oh like is this actually a thing that i want to be doing um like why am i doing this in the first place right like how, how, did, how did that even end up happening um, and and uh, maybe you might learn uh, something or two and uh, leave a comment, please. Yeah, yeah. How's that working out for you? Yeah, and engage with others and talk to others about your ideas. Don't be afraid 
to engage with others. Um, because that's that's part of sense making, right? Is this outward looking thing and engage with others who disagree with you, uh, so that you can get some certainty about what what it is you're you're thinking and doing and how your grammar is working for you and how your frames are working for you. And yeah, absolutely, you know, leave, leave a comment and tell us how we're doing and and what you want to see more of or less of or or what you liked or didn't like or you know future future topic ideas any of that because feedback is very important, right? It's all about signaling ultimately, and having good signals is the thing that helps us with sense making. The better signals we have, the better sense we make of the world, and the better sense I can make of the world, the better sense other people can also make of the world. And that goes for everybody, right? It just kind of spreads out. And that's where that's where the potential exists, because I don't know what can manifest if we all have better sense making. Uh, but I know it will be better. <laughs>